Okay, let's continue with our study of chemical uh, kinetics. We're now going to look at a mathematical aspect of reactions, and we're going to learn to use the uh, method of initial rates to determine the rate law of a reaction. Many of the reactions that we do in chemistry are reversible. They go forward and then they reverse and return. We're not going to deal with really complicated rate laws that involve these reversible reactions. So again, as we do create products and they begin to turn back into reactions, this can make for very difficult measurements beyond the scope of this class. Early on in a reaction, the rate will depend only on the initial amounts of reactants. And that's why it's called the initial rate method, because it uses initial concentrations. And we will have typically only reactants present. And that's going to make the solving much simpler for us. So we're going to measure our reactants as soon as they're mixed in order to catch them before any products are formed. This is called the initial rate method for determining a rate law. In order to use this method, we need to run a reaction several times. The initial concentrations of the reactants are going to be varied. What we're really trying to see is how each reactant affects the rate. So if we vary the reactants by holding the others constant, we can see the effect that that reactant has on the rate of the reaction. Again, we're going to measure just after the reactants are mixed in order to eliminate that uh, effect of the reverse reaction that would make it much more difficult for us to solve mathematically. So let's look at this reaction. We have three reactants, and you'll see when we write the rate law, these are the only reactants that we're interested in. We're not interested in the reverse reaction and the formation of the products, just how each reactant affects the rate. So the general form of a rate law is for this reaction would be the rate constant times each reactant molarity okay, raised to a power. And it's those powers that we have to determine experimentally. We cannot use the balanced equation, the 5 and the 6 and the 1. They don't tell us how the collisions between the bromate ion and the bromide ion and the hydrogen ion occur. They don't tell us how each of these ions affects the formation of these products. That has to be done experimentally, and then we use that experimental data to determine what are called the orders of the reaction. So we've collected data. We've run an experiment. These are our molarities of the bromate, bromide, and hydrogen ion. And then we measured the rate of the reaction. Okay. We'll discuss later how do we actually measure a rate. We have to obviously look for some change to occur. Maybe a precipitate forms. Maybe there's a color change or an energy change. But something that tells us the reaction is taking place. So we look at the concentrations, and in all of these experiments, we have changed one of the ions and kept the others the same in order to see how each reactant affects the rate. So if we look at how the bromate ion affects the rate, we have picked the experiment where the bromate ion has changed, and the other two ions remain constant, so that we're seeing only the effect of the bromate ion on that rate. And what we do is we take that data and we set it up, and we look at rate 2 and the concentrations of those reactants over 
and then we divide by rate 1. And the reason we're picking rate 2 over rate 1 is we typically want to make it easy on ourselves, and we pick a whole number rather than a fractional. You'd still get the same relationship if you had rate 1 over rate 2, but this way we can see that our concentration has doubled, and then we're looking at the effect it has on the rate. These concentrations are not affecting the rate because they are being held constant. So again, we would cancel those out, and now we're looking at the relationship between the rate, how did the rate change when the concentration changed. So we can see that 2 divided by 1 would give us a 2, so as we doubled our concentration, we doubled our rate, and this n is going to give us that relationship. Well, the relationship between 2 and 2 is a first power, or a first order. So what this is saying is when we doubled this concentration, the rate also doubled. That is a first order relationship. So the reaction is first order with respect to bromate. So if we double the bromate ion concentration, the rate doubles. We now want to look at how the bromide ion affects the rate. So we pick an experiment where the bromide ion changes its concentrations, but the other two ions are constant. And then we look at the effect on rate. So we set up our ratio, rate 3, which would be the concentrations that we have. Here's rate 3 okay. over rate 2. And again, we're picking this just because we want to have a whole number relationship and we've got a higher concentration and a larger rate. So when these cancel out, we basically get 2 over 1, which is 1, and, excuse me, which is 2, and 3.2 over 1.6 which gives us 2. So we have another pretty simple relationship. as And it's always your concentration that's raised to the order. So we're looking at how the concentration change affected the rate change. Okay. So the rate doubled and the concentration doubled, which gives us another first order with respect to the bromide ion. So when bromide is doubled, the rate doubles. Pretty simple relationship. Now we're going to look at the hydrogen ion. So we have to hunt around and find a reaction where the hydrogen ion has changed its concentration, okay, and the bromide ion and the bromate ion remain constant. Okay. I want you to work this out on your own and bring it to class so that we can discuss the relationship between these ions. And then we'll show how we determine the overall rate law. So after you've worked this out yourself, You can see that this relationship is different than what we've seen previously. Here, our rate changes by a factor of 4, where our concentration has only doubled. So this is a second order, or a square, relationship. As hydrogen concentration was doubled, our rate actually quadrupled. So hydrogen concentration has a huge effect on the rate. A second order is going to have a much larger effect on a reaction rate than a first order. So now, once we have found the rate law, so we now have a law that tells us how these substances react, we now find the rate constant. And that's simply taking usually our first set of data. We take the rate from that set and the concentrations and raise them to the powers that we've determined, and we solve for the rate constant. 
Once we have a rate constant and a rate order, we then could put any concentrations in here and determine the rate mathematically without having to do the experiment. The same k could be determined with any set of data. There'll be some experimental error, but it's standard that we use the first set of data. Notice the unit for k which is sort of a strange unit. We've got molarity to the negative 3 power, and then, so that's molarity negative 3 over seconds. To determine the rate law constant unit, you have to look. Rate law constant is always going to be rate over the molarity raised to whatever order you've determined. So for first order, okay, it's going to be rate, which is already going to be molarity per second, over molarity, and if you do the algebra with that, you're going to end up canceling molarities and getting the unit inverse seconds. For a second order, you've got still rate, which is molarity per second, over molarity squared, so you're going to end up canceling one of those molarities and ending up with another molarity on the bottom, okay, giving you molarity negative one second negative one. So basically one over molarity, one over time.